background. I hope I'm hooked up this morning. Mr. Traverso was talking to you last time about uh, microorganisms in wine and a uh, comment or two to close up that discussion before we go back to grapes. First of all, I guess I'd better make a general comment or two. I've been having quite a few people coming to me and asking, well, how about if I take my quiz in some other discussion section? Don't do it. There are several good reasons why this is a bad idea, and we will not permit just drifting around uh, between quiz sections. If you have a good reason, then see your discussion leader and make some arrangements. But uh, among the reasons that would affect you are the fact that if you take a quiz in another quiz section, you run the risk that we will we'll have thrown in a, t a question that we know they've covered in discussion, but we know you may not have in your discussion group. So the quizzes are not the same, and that makes a difference. Another good reason is that with 300 people in the class and four quizzes, that's 1,200 pieces of information that we have to keep straight. And last year, or last quarter, we had, uh, I think, six errors that have come to our attention in the regard of somebody taking a quiz in the wrong place. And although we try very much to keep it straight, uh, it is possible with that many numbers to make mistakes. So that it, you're in a discussion group, go to that discussion group, make all your arrangements with that discussion leader, please. And not with me. I get rather tired of having calls at 8 o'clock Sunday evening and all this kind of thing, uh, which I don't really feel uh, is handling your business properly if you find it necessary to do that kind of thing. The... Uh, Microorganisms have been, I think, well discussed from what I can read in the uh, outline that was used, with the possible exception of the general comments with regard to other microorganisms beyond the ones that have been mentioned, mainly yeast, lactic acid bacteria, and acetic acid bacteria. How about any other organism? Well, there is an occasion where we might be concerned about molds, but generally speaking, molds are not of great significance to the winemaker. They are a minor sanitation problem. You don't want moldy, you don't want your barrel to have mold all over the outside when the tourists come through. Uh, it doesn't look very good, and you have a little sanitation problem in the cleanup and prevention of mold growth in the visible part of the winery. In the invisible part, such as inside of containers and so forth, you don't usually have any problem because molds, uh, and I'm being very unscientific, but the filamentous fungi that we generally think of as molds are obligate aerobes as opposed to facultative or what have you, and therefore they cannot grow in closed containers where they don't have good access to air. Not only that, they're rather susceptible to alcohol vapor and high amount, and uh, they don't generally like the conditions that would pertain in a wine cast. So they do not grow on wine or in the surface of casts above wine uh, in the normal circumstance. An empty cast now, that's another matter. It may mold rather readily, but again, SO2 easily prevents that. So generally speaking, the winemaker needn't be concerned about molds, except as the possible vineyard hazard and certain molds do grow on grapes under some circumstances, usually high humidity in the vineyard. And then you get bunch rot uh, where the clusters are spoiled, and of course they wouldn't be harvested and brought in as a rule. Occasionally there might be a bad berry or two, and uh, this is ordinarily no uh, particular problem, except that we would like to eliminate it as completely as possible uh, in view of the potential off flavors and the fact that a mold-infected berry rapidly becomes acetic and uh, uh, would contribute uh, volatile acid and other uh, characteristics to the wine. There is, however, one mold that ought to be mentioned uh, as a microorganism of concern, and that's Botrytis cinerea. Botrytis R, sorry. Botrytis. Uh, something's wrong with my spelling here. I'll get it right yet. I have to write so big I can hardly see what I'm doing. Botrytis cinerea is a mold that is sometimes called the noble mold in French, German, and English. No, noble mold in English, Edelfaula in German, and Porritieu noble in French, if you'll excuse my accent again. How can it be a noble mold? 
Well, the noble mold implies that under some circumstances, this particular mold can produce a kind of effect on grapes that makes a very interesting and luscious type of table wine. What happens is that this mold is rather unusual in that it can grow on the surface of a healthy grape. Most molds can't. Most molds have to infect an injured grape or a damaged grape of some sort. But this one can grow on and through the skin of a healthy grape uh, when the humidity is high and its growth, growth conditions are good for it. When that happens, the perforated skin then becomes permeable to the moisture in the grape. And the action of the, of the mold would encourage this as well. So that the grape shrivels, loses moisture, and you get a very high sugar uh, grape juice to be fermented into wine. And it's so high sugar that the yeast can't convert all the sugar to alcohol. It gets alcohol to an inhibitory level before all the sugar is fermented. For that reason, you end up with a sweet table wine. And French sauternes and certain other wines you'll be hearing about later on are made taking, making use of this particular effect of this particular mold. This isn't always a desirable effect. If it happens on a red grape, then the mold produces enzymatic activity, which causes the red color to turn brown. And so you don't get a nice red wine, you get a brown wine. So ordinarily, it's only of advantage on white wine, white grapes or white wine, and even then only in special circumstances. The special circumstances being high humidity so the mold can infect the grape, then low humidity to dry the grape and get a shriveled product. Not a raisin because it isn't sun-dried, doesn't have the caramel taste. The shriveled grape has a concentrated sugar, but it also has a concentrated uh, grapiness and also a special character due to the mold. Uh, which is considered uh, desirable, a rather nice, uh, unusual flavor due to the mold. So that this can be uh, an advantage. Also, the mold does in, uh, metabolize some of the acid, so that the acid is not equally concentrated with the sugar. For that reason, you don't get too acid a wine, and you do get a high sugar and a reasonably high alcohol. Uh, not only is this bad, however, on red grapes, but it can be bad if you don't get this period of low humidity following the infection. If it stays wet, rainy, after the mold infects the grape, then you just get rot. Other molds invade as well, and pretty soon you'll lose your crop. So that uh, uh, it, it's, it takes rather unusual viticultural conditions for this to be desirable, and by and large, these conditions don't occur except in very few areas in the world, uh, an area of Hungary, an area of Germany, and an area of France, uh, and not, uh, at least not very often in California. I know of one vineyard that has managed to make a rather good uh, noble molded sweet table wine by this kind of an effect, but since it happens rarely here, uh, we, we don't make any effort to capitalize upon it, and generally we have not made any such wines. Uh, the final comment from a microorganism viewpoint that I'd like to make, I think was made uh, by Mr. Traverso, but I'd like to amplify it a little bit. Uh, how about all sorts of disease germs? I think we've made the point that you can get typhoid fever from water and sometimes from milk and tuberculosis and so on. What do you get from wine? Well, you get nothing from wine. And that's what Pasteur had in mind in, in the movie. He was quoted as saying the wine is the most healthful, and I'd say hygienic, the movie man said hygienic, whatever that is, uh, hygienic beverage uh, of all. Well, uh, Pasteur was a microbiologist. He was working with diseases, and he had in mind you can't get sick from wine. He didn't mean to say it was full of uh, nutritious value, uh, and that's true. Organisms generally will not live in wine, and no human pathogens or disease or sickness-producing organisms will live in wine, even if added. And this is one reason why wine mixed with water has been a beverage uh, used in certain areas of Europe, even for babies, for a long time. Uh, if you have uh, typhoid contaminated water, you'd better mix it with wine or it'll give you typhoid fever. And uh, if it mixed with wine and wait a little bit, it won't. So that uh, uh, this is one thing that's very good about wine and has made wine a useful product, a useful beverage under circumstances when many other things, even water, we're not really fit to drink. I think that's uh, the main follow-up items I cared to bring up about microorganisms. Then let's turn back to discussing grapes for wine. We had discussed, I think, satisfactorily, uh, <clears throat> from my viewpoint, I hope from yours, the uh, 
different varieties of, and species of grapes, and we were just beginning to talk about viticulture, so we should talk briefly about the seasonal sequence. What happens, I guess you, those of you raised in California must have seen vineyards at various times of the year. You know that during the winter, the vineyard is dormant. There are no leaves. It's a deciduous plant. It drops its leaves in the winter and stays dormant till spring. Ordinarily, if we consider, say, Davis and a mid-season grape, like, for instance, Carignan, so if we're talking about Davis and Carignan as an example, about the 1st of April, you would expect the temperature to get such that the grapes will begin to grow and prosper for the coming year. So that roughly the 1st of April, and certainly if you pass vineyards now, you'll see most of them are beginning uh, to leaf out and have shoots visible. Uh, the vineyard is called this pushing, so that the buds begin to push or or begin to grow, say roughly the 1st of April, and leaves begin to form. About the 15th of May, the grapes will bloom. Now, the flowers of grapes are not very conspicuous unless you get out away from the road and in the vineyard, you may not even see them. They're very small little flowers, and, and you'd recognize what, what's going to be the cluster because the stem shape and so forth is already there, and actually just before they bloom, on if you went through Wixon Hall on picnic day, you saw a few potted vines, some of which had what looked like little teeny grape clusters. Well, that was the bloom forming and had not yet bloomed. About the 15th of May, they will bloom. And then from there till about the 15th of July, you'll see a, just a little hard uh, pea-like grape gradually enlarging and not much seems to be happening. Then about the 15th of July, this grape will begin to enlarge fairly rapidly and that we consider that the onset of ripening about the 15th of July. Up to that point, the grape is growing largely by cell division. From that point on, it's growing largely by enlargement of the existing cells, so that uh, you divide many cells up to the 15th of July, and then you pump up each one like, a, like blowing up a, a ball uh, from that point on, and you blow it up with uh, sugar water mainly. About the 15th of September, the grape would be expected to be ripe. Again, that's quite variable depending on variety and where you're located, but I'm thinking of, a, again, a mid-season grape uh, and uh, Davis area as an example. The uh, grape size uh, would be, say, roughly a, a gram at the 15th of July and maybe five grams at the 15th of September. So a great deal of sugar water must be pushed into the grape in that period of time. And the health of the vine and the number of leaves per berry is important in how well it ripens. Then if you harvest the berry or, uh, when it's ripe, about the 15th of September, the vine will continue to uh, grow and, or not grow, but continue to photosynthesize and put down uh, starch in its uh, uh, canes and in its trunk so that it will survive the winter. And it'll go drop its leaves and go dormant when it gets cold in the fall, usually around uh, November the 1st or so in, in Davis. And then it'll be dormant all winter and then go through the same process again in the spring, being pruned and readied by the vineyardist during the winter for the next spring. Now that total period of from the 1st of April to the 15th of September is 165 days. And the total range possible with grapes from from uh, sprouting or pushing to ripeness is about uh, 90 days for the most rapid uh, growing and about 165 or so for the uh, slowest. Maybe even the most extreme would be even higher to make it easy to remember, let's say double. So from 90 to 180 uh, would be the extreme range of different grape varieties in how they would ripen. You see, that's quite a difference. That's uh, well, on a 30-day month basis, that's from three months uh, to six months in terms of ripening. So you can see if you have a summer period in your area that's only three months long, you better not plant grapes that require six months to get ripe or you aren't going to have much luck in producing uh, wine from uh, your underripe grapes. To give you an idea of the, the period of ripening, Besides this volume increase, which we've indicated is four to five fold, caused largely by cell enlargement, the red color in a red grape begins to appear at about the 15th of July, and of course is adequate or complete by the time the grape is ripe. Uh, the sugar begins to increase, and it increases rapidly against the gradient. In other words, the sap of the 
uh, cane is not very high in sugar, but the sugar content of the berry is very high. So in other words, you're pushing sugar again into the berry against the gradient, which takes uh, chemical work to do, and you're concentrating the sugar in the berry. Again, uh, showing the very high photosynthetic activity and high metabolic capability of a grapevine. To give you an idea of this uh, effect, let me draw a uh, quick uh, graph of a typical development where this would be the time scale on the bottom line. So if we say this is ripe at the 15th of September, and this is uh, just starting to ripe at about the fifth, ripen about the 15th of July. And then we're going to talk about uh, sugar increase. Uh, the value should be around 7 tenths percent sugar when it starts, something near zero, but not quite zero. And don't let this figure worry you. I'm going to have more to say about that uh, either late today or tomorrow, or Thursday, rather. But uh, this is sugar now. so. Sugar content is not zero, but it is low. And then when the grape is ripe, we're going to pick it at a ripe sugar content of somewhere maybe 23% over here. Well, how does it get from there to there? It increases slowly and then increases in rate and then begins to level off, maybe not quite that soon, maybe up a little further like this so that it begins to level off uh, at 23. Now, if you didn't pick it at 23, it might go on up, particularly if there's drying conditions so that you're losing water, or in fact, it can fall off slightly, particularly if it should rain and there should be, uh, would be a uh, supply of water. I said don't worry about this being uh, sugar. Maybe I should bring up the fact that if you measured the bricks, it would be about four degrees, so that four degrees bricks or seven-tenths percent sugar would be about typical at this point, whereas up here, uh, we would be thinking of this as largely 23 degrees bricks, which is pretty much a measure of sugar. We'll have more to say about that later on. <clears throat> By the way, Mr. Traverso tells me that he gave you the wrong value for bricks. Bricks is grams of, of dissolved solids per 100 grams of solution. He said 100 milliliters. It's not too critical, but uh, just to make sure you're on the right wavelength, it should be per 100 grams of solution. All right, this is the way the sugar is increased in grapes. And we've mentioned that this value is high for wine grapes and rather low for most other fruits, uh, such as, say, 12% for apples and about 16% for pineapples and uh, so on and so forth. So that it, its high value is important to making a proper wine grape. Now, how about acid? Acid starts at about 3% when the initiation of ripeness would occur. And depending on when you pick it, let's say this is rather hot. We're talking about Davis. We pick it at about a half percent. That may be a little bit low. But again, how does it get from there to there? Well, it's something like this with some leveling off here. Now, maybe not that smoothly either, because this is affected by weather. So it might go along high and then drop when you've got some hot weather, and we'll have a word or two to say about that in a minute. Now, the, this apparent loss of sugar from 3% sugar down to a half uh, acid, excuse me, the apparent loss of acid from 3% acid down to a half percent acid is uh, largely a result of two effects. Now, we said that the grape would increase of the order of uh, uh, four to five fold in volume. So you have a dilution effect. In other words, if you're producing no more acid than you had in the first place, say this is a one gram berry here, and this is a five gram berry down here, then if you divide this by five, you'd have six tenths. So instead of five-tenths, you'd expect to get six-tenths just from dilution alone, and that accounts then for most of the change. The other uh, effect we generally call respiration, call it metabolism if you want, uh, by the grape itself. In other words, the grape respires or uses up part of the acid 
and the more it uses is related to the hot weather. The hotter it is, the more it will use. So if it was extremely hot, it might end up at 0.4 over here, in which case the dilution would account for the drop to 0.6, and the additional 0.2 drop would be accounted for by the hotter weather. Uh, so that uh, those are the two factors. The dilution is the larger in magnitude, but the respiration is perhaps the most important in uh, uh, controlling wine quality because we can do something about that, at least in terms of selecting where our vineyard is located because we can put our vineyard where the weather isn't usually so hot. Well, well you, you got, I think, the figure of conversion of sugar to alcohol. On a dry table wine, it would be all fermented, and you'd get alcohol equivalent to 0.55 times this would be your alcohol content. Yeah, so the, the high sugar is related to producing high alcohol. That's right. Or lower sugar, uh, insufficient alcohol. Okay, so I, I, those are the two ways that the acid can drop, and although... In magnitude, the dilution is the most important. In terms of uh, vineyard management and vineyard selection, uh, the respiration may be uh, very important. And also the difference between different vintages. So this year maybe is a very hot year, and a typical problem is going to be low acid in the wine. Maybe other years might be very cool relative to the average, and then we would have high acid, sometimes too high, depending on where you're located. The influence of these environmental factors on the grape growing and what sort of wine should be made from a given grape is quite important. And uh, first of all, our growing season, this uh, 90 to 180 days, uh, is an important factor. If we make a crude drawing, and I'll make a very crude one, of the earth, so that uh, this is uh, uh, North America and South America and uh, Europe over here and uh, Africa over here and so forth. Uh, on the earth we can draw a couple of belts above and below the equator within which grapes generally will do reasonably well. And on the polar ends of either of these belts it becomes too cold. The growing season becomes too short. The grapes don't generally grow well and if you're going to grow near the limits, you may have to grow American species, which are more cold resistant and so forth than the European species. On the other hand, on the tropical side, the equatorial side of both belts, the humidity tends to be high in some areas. If the humidity isn't high, it tends to be awfully desertish. Uh, and the vine may not go dormant in the wintertime. And so while the grapevine isn't quite as demanding in the dormancy sense as many other plants like peach trees and so on, uh, nevertheless, it does generally require a dormant period uh, and doesn't do, it, it must be specially managed or doesn't do well in the tropics where there isn't a dormant period, uh, the grapes that we commonly grow in any case. So as a consequence, we have these two belts. Now obviously you aren't going to grow grapes in the ocean and then there'll be mountains and so on that aren't too suitable. So within these areas you have spotty locations that will be just right for growing grapes. So that there is a large area of the world that is suitable for growing grapes. And as I heard it expressed once that uh, obviously God loves mankind because he distributed a reasonable amount of, of uh, good grape growing areas all over the world and every continent has some. Uh, I suppose that uh, is uh, a thought at least that indicates wherever grapes grow nicely, it's pretty good for humans. And it's one good reason to go into viticulture or enology, I suppose. But uh, there are some corollaries to this that are rather interesting. Since humidity is a problem on the equatorial side, and since cold is a problem on the uh, polar side, and since the American species like Vitus labrusca tend to resist these effects uh, more than does the European grape, that means that the Brazilian grape grower and the New York state grape grower are likely to grow the same kind of grapes. In fact, that is the case. In Brazil, Isabella is a common variety uh, grown and uh, is uh, Vitus labrusca derived, uh, whereas in New York, uh, Concord is the common one and also uh, Vitus labrusca derived. Uh, the mildew is a, uh, the humidity, high humidity is a problem not so much that the grape itself doesn't like the high humidity, but the molds and mildews will grow on the grapes at that 
condition. And the uh, cold weather is a hazard in its own right, uh, and then other pests uh, do also influence what kind of grapes can be grown in which place. Certain mildews, for instance, uh, don't grow well in California because it's too dry uh, and do grow well uh, east of the Mississippi because it's rather humid in the summer. And this same mold will be a problem in some areas of Europe because of the summer rains that we generally don't have. Well, we said that the grapes generally begin to grow about uh, the 1st of April, begin to push in, uh, in Davis. Why? How, how do we know? Or what, what influences that? Well, grapes generally begin to grow and grow more rapidly as the temperature arises above an average of 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So the threshold for grape growing is about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, this figure uh, is taken as an average daily temperature for most of our purposes, so that when the average daily temperature rises to 50 degrees in the spring, it's about the 1st of April, and the grapes will begin to grow. Uh, we commonly use these figures uh, to get some information about what kind of, what variety of grapes to plant, uh, how long the season is, and so forth, by adding up the number of so-called degree days above 50 degrees. So we're concerned about degree days. And we generally, in the great business, describe this as heat summation. With grapes, we're concerned with 50 degrees Fahrenheit. With certain other plants, the same concept is used but uh, is, uh, different temperatures are used because of the requirements of the different plants. So if you have a long, hot summer, you're going to have a higher heat summation for that summer. And this is uh, what we commonly do, is we add the heat summation units above 50. So in a typical, this, this could be improved, you understand, but in the typical way we do it, we would say that, say, the maximum for a given day is uh, what, say 110 degrees Fahrenheit, nice hot day in Davis, and say that evening or that night, the minimum temperature is, what would we say, about 60, I suppose, a uh, fairly warm night. Then we add those two v values together, and we'd get 170, and we'd divide by two, and say, what is that, 85? we would say that the average temperature for that day is 85 degrees Fahrenheit. So taking the maximum and the minimum for each day and adding divided by two gives the average daily temperature in the way we commonly do it. And then we would say, since the grape only grows above 50, we'll subtract the 50. And for that particular day, we'll have 35 degrees or 35 heat summation units to add to our summer's total. And we'll do that for every day. And at the end of the, year, end of the summer, we'll have a grand heat summation for that season in that vineyard. And these values then range from, say, roughly 1,700 to roughly 5,200. And if you're not in that range, you better not grow grapes. If it's colder, if you have less heat summation, you have either a very short season or a very cool season, you better not grow grapes commercially. It's too, too cold for grapes. And if it's 5,200 or better, you might not want to either because it's likely to be too hot. You'll get heat damage, sunburning, and maybe uh, raisining of your grapes. So that those are the ranges that we'd want to deal with. Now, in this context, then, to give you a couple more examples, suppose we had uh, 10 days with the average daily temperature of 60 degrees. Then we'd have 10 degree days for each one. 10 times 10 would equal 100 heat summation units. So that we can make some economies of calculation if you like. Now this concept in terms of characterizing a vineyard is very useful if you have rather uniform temperature. And since years tend to be rather similar in California, nice hot sunny weather as a rule, it's been most useful, I guess, for California as compared to, say, Europe, where the weather is quite variable from one year to another. So we've made more use of this heat summation concept 
in, in, a, in a valuable way, I think, than most other parts of the world because our weather is uniform. But even here, it's important not just to talk about one year. So ordinarily, we would take an average of 10 years. So when we characterize a vineyard and say that this uh, particular vineyard has a heat summation uh, total of uh, 2,500, this should be an average of, say, 10 years in order to be characteristic because there will be enough variation from one year to the next that uh, uh, you need a uh, consistent weather and you need an average over a period of time in order to properly characterize a vineyard area. Now, what use is this kind of characterization? Well, I've given you this extreme range. Let's talk about uh, more typical divisions. We divide these into what we call climatic regions. Now, the climatic regions that we're talking about don't necessarily mean where they're located in the state. It, roughly, they do, but it's quite possible to have a vineyard on top of a mountain that is climatic region two and one at the bottom of the same mountain that's climatic region three or four or even five. In any case, we give these Roman numerals one, two, three, four, and five. And I'll, re I'll say these aloud for those who are below the podium and can't see them. The region one is the coolest at about 2,000 uh, plus. Region uh, two is still considered cool at from 2000, uh, at on up to 2,500 and uh, 2,500 to 3,000. In other words, one is 2,000 to 2,500, two is 2,500 to 3,000, and each one goes up by 500 heat summation units. So five is 4,000 or over, four is 3,500 to 4,000 and so on. And in terms of names, we would consider this one uh, very cool and the second one cool, and uh, I guess we would say moderately cool. We're, we're hung up on cool, I guess. But uh, then we would say warm and very warm. Could even go so far as to say hot. If, you, if you've lived in a 4,000 plus region, you know it gets pretty warm and stays that way during the summer. And as I said before, if you get beyond about 5,200 or below 1,700, then you shouldn't grow grapes, try to grow them commercially at least, uh, because it's too cold or too hot, depending on which end. Now, these numbers are very helpful because they give you some idea of knowing what can you grow in the different regions and what uh, certain grape varieties. A uh, grape variety that is grown here has to be a short season, early ripening grape, and you'd think of Chardonnay for whites and Pinot Noir for uh, red table wines. Not only that, but we said the respiration was such that the acid was retained better in the cool. So you get nice acid retention here and uh, make a nice table wine as a consequence. But you might have trouble getting enough sugar. Whereas down here, you'd have dickens of a time retaining acid, the hot place, but on the other hand, you would get very good sugar content and it'd be a good place then to grow dessert wines. So uh, we probably want to grow dessert wines and appetizer wines here, table wines here, and then the varieties selected between them uh, uh, to match the season. So that as it gets slightly warmer, you might go from Pinot Noir to Cabernet Sauvignon, and then uh, Ruby Cabernet and the red table wines, and then in region five, you shouldn't grow uh, red table wines at all. Uh, at least uh, you're going to have to expect difficulty if you do, and low acid and so forth. So these numbers are quite useful, but they are only a rough guide, and you can imagine, considering the maximum minimum temperatures have been used and so forth, it isn't as clear-cut as we would like, so that the microclimate of a given vineyard is important. These climatic regions are rather gross measures, then how about the microclimate? Well, by microclimate, we would mean the specific uh, layout and weather that is affecting a given vineyard. So again, taking the example of the vineyard on the mountain, not only is it going to get more intense sunlight, perhaps, maybe above the certain cloud levels and won't get as much fog and so forth. On the other hand, uh, it's likely to stay cool a good deal later in the day 
and so forth. So that the specific location in terms of air drainage and sun exposure makes a lot of difference in a given vineyard. And when we talk about, or when Dr. Amrin talks about Germany, he'll mention that on the Rhine River, which has very high steep banks on the one side and on the curves and bends of the river where the banks face the sun, you have some of the highest priced vineyard land and producing the best wine of certain kinds in the world. On the other side of the river, you have pine trees and nothing much worth anything because uh, the sun just doesn't come on that side enough. Or even around the bend of the river where the angle of the bank faces away from the sun or not directly toward the sun, you won't have good vineyards and good ripening conditions for grapes. I might give you a small table that gives you some idea of how these things uh, are uh, useful in determining some of the compositional effects of grapes or relationships of grapes. We have uh, two regions and uh, two areas and we're going to grow the same grape. Let's just say Carignan again as an example which is red. It's one of those non-distinctive vitus viniferas that's grown in large acreage. Say we have a warm vineyard and a cool vineyard. Just for example, this might be Davis, which is region four, and this might be, say, uh, what, the uh, uh, Piscinus area near the coast where it's uh, region uh, two or three, depending on where you are in the valley. Uh, how about ripeness? In the warm region, it's going to be ripe uh, rather early because it is warm. Now, we're not talking about taking an early grape versus a late grape. We're saying the same grape grown in the two areas will be rather early in the warm place and rather late in the cool. And you see, that's contrary to what you'd like because uh, in the cool district, you may have enough trouble getting it to ripen at all. So if it's going to ripen very late, it may be frosting and uh, uh, you may never get it quite right. The sugar content is going to be high, say 23% on the harvest date. And uh, in the other place, it's going to be relatively low, say uh, oh, 21% if you're lucky. And so the, the drop would be 10%. So it would be 10% less sweet when you harvest uh, in the uh, uh, cool region than in the warm region as a rule. Now, if you waited long enough and you didn't get frosted, you might get this one as high as this, but the tendency would be as stated. Acid would tend to be uh, low in the warm region, as we've already indicated, and high in the cool regions. And the amount, say, might be six tenths percent here and uh, oh nine tenths percent here and on a percentage basis that's much bigger you see you have a third more 33 percent more rather than two percent less uh, in the acid color meaning red color let's put that red would be in the warm region low and in the cool region high uh, this is contrary to some of the other effects but the red pigments, the anthocyanin pigments of grapes, apparently are higher in concentration when the grape is grown in a cool region than when grown in a warm region. And just giving it some arbitrary numbers, if, it, if it's equivalent to about 100 there, it's probably going to be 150 uh, units here. In other words, uh, again, 33% higher in the uh, cool region than compared to the warm. Now, in terms of flavor, flavor is uh, of the grape now we're thinking of. Uh, we're talking about the bricks acid ratio. In other words, the sugar divided by the acid gives the bricks acid ratio. And the, the sugar acid ratio then would be, in the case of the warm region, would be sweeter, sweet, but flat. Flat meaning low acid. So it would tend to be sweet and low acid and rather flat in the warm region, whereas it would be tart and fruit, fruity in the cooler region. And this again tends to jive with what we've told you before in that you'd expect to make then the best kind of wine in the cool region would be table wine. And in the uh, warmer region would be a dessert or appetizer.
So if you were going to make dessert and appetizer wine, you would do better to grow it in a, in a warm region. So Davis has the capability of producing better sherry, better port, and so on, than does, say, the Napa Valley. On the other hand, the Napa Valley has the better uh, chance of producing a good table wine than does Davis. And the same kind of consideration would uh, govern other wine producing regions of the world. Now we talked about uh, microclimate very briefly. How about uh, specific uh, weather conditions that may be deleterious? Not just microclimate, not just vineyard location related, but, but weather, uh, uh, rainstorms, this kind of thing. Heat damage can be rather significant as a source of difficulty in growing grapes. Uh, for instance, the Coachella Valley, which has been in the news just now with the uh, uh, labor uh, strife starting up again, uh, the Coachella Valley produces the earliest table grapes. And one of the reasons it's in the news already is that they harvest their grapes uh, early in June. So the gr ripe grapes come from the Coachella Valley, table grapes, uh, early in June. And uh, obviously, if you're going to have a strike, the time to do it is when the grapes are apt to spoil right quick. And uh, this is one of the things that's bad, I think, about agricultural labor strife because it does tend to uh, hit both parties at a time when they A, lose the most of their work or B, lose their crop if uh, can't reach a settlement. In any case, uh, if you're going to grow grapes in the Coachella Valley, which is up around the 5,500 uh, heat summation unit, in that case you want early grapes so you can get it harvested in a way before the weather gets terribly hot because very, very hot weather, say over an over a air temperature of 105 degrees Fahrenheit or more, you get sunburning and damage to the fruit. Now, generally, it's called sunburning because the main effect is on the vine or the, the fruit cluster parts that are exposed to the sun. But heat damage generally occurs when the air temperature is over 105 degrees. And those of you who've lived in the hotter parts of the central California know that's not a terribly rare occurrence. If the air temperature is that high and you have a cluster of grapes that is not completely shaded by the leaves, then where the sun can hit those fruit directly, you're going to get heat damage and sunburning. And the effect can be quite different depending on when it occurs. If the sunburning hot weather occurs very early in the year, then you have these little tiny uh, berries that are going to be damaged but not get any bigger. In other words, they were too small to, to contribute much to yield. So in, you'll kill them early, they'll turn black, they'll turn hard, and they won't contribute to wine because they just stay on the stems when you make wine and don't do anything. So early sun burning will generally not affect quality. If it will not lower quality, might even raise it if your plant was overcropped. There were too many berries on the plant, but they will affect yield. So early, when early sun burning would lower yield, but not lower quality. And late, on the other hand, would scald the berries, and they would be pretty good size. They would affect, uh, the yield is already largely made, but they'd affect uh, the off flavors and back bad uh, quality features. So late sun burning then does the opposite, leaves yield more or less alone, and affects the flavor of the wine, giving raisiny, caramelized, and off flavors. Of course, the hot weather does affect destruction of acid, as we've already mentioned. I guess we should mention that uh, the destruction of the acid is not uniform. The two major acids are tartaric acid in grapes and malic. And different grape varieties have different ratios of the two. Some varieties are nearly all tartaric acid. Some varieties have as much as half as malic, and I suppose the typical situation would be roughly 20% malic. Now, the reason this is important is that the tartaric acid is relatively inert, so it doesn't change very much in hot weather, or at least it takes a lot more hot weather to bring it down. But malic is very quickly brought down in hot weather, so in hot weather, the malic might even be almost completely removed, so that uh, the, the variety you would want to grow would generally be one that has a high tartaric acid content uh, and a rather good acid retention in hot weather. So that uh, the kind of weather you expect, both in a climatic region sense and in a uh, particular year, does have a lot to do with the quality of the wine that you will get. There are some effects of uh, cold weather that ought to be mentioned. 
uh, clearly we've already discussed briefly the effect of winter killing and we've mentioned the fact that if you don't have a winter dormant period this is bad uh, along with this it's important to realize that if you have a winter dormancy period it ought to stay constant in other words if your vine is dormant and then you have a warm period and the vine thinks it's spring and begins to grow uh, then returns to cold weather you're going to kill those buds and the vine will be seriously damaged depending on the extent of uh, the frost effect so that winters for good grape growing not only should be cool enough to produce dormancy but they should be fairly uniform and consistently cool without periods of warm weather that break dormancy and then cause trouble by returning to cold. Generally speaking, for the European wine grape, Vitus vinifera, you don't want zero degrees Fahrenheit uh, at all if you can help it. And if it exists for more than a very short time, say a day or two, so that the ground gets uh, zero degrees rather deeply, uh, you're going to kill the vine. So that winter killing by zero Fahrenheit or more is a real problem with Vitus vinifera. In Russia, for instance, they bury most of the vines under dirt so that the, every year, so they'll survive the winter. And you can imagine that's rather hard on the vine and very expensive. Uh, it's one of the reasons that uh, uh, New York wine growing and certain other states of, of the U.S. have a good deal of trouble growing Vitus vinifera. It's just too cold. They may grow well for a few years, but along comes a particularly cold winter kills the vines and you have to replant and this uh, is too expensive to sustain the industry. Uh, for example, the, the variety grown in Germany called Müller Turgau, a fairly recent uh, development in viticultural history, uh, had been planted for around 40 years in, uh, in the Rhine region of Germany, but in 1961 they had an unusually cold winter and discovered to their sorrow that this variety is rather uh, intolerant of cold weather and a good many of the vineyards were seriously damaged where certain other varieties weren't. By the same token, either fall frosts or spring frosts uh, can be a problem. You have fall killing, a typical situation would be say around Merced where the, uh, you've maybe irrigated the vineyards, the vineyard stays nice and uh, it's warm weather, the leaves are still on, the vine's still storing up carbohydrates for the winter, and then a storm blows out of the Yosemite area and then the first thing you know you've got frost while the leaves were still green. They didn't have time to go dormant and fall off. This can kill the vine and certainly is injurious to the vine. By the same token, the spring frost, particularly in the Napa and coastal valleys, are a big problem because the vines will begin to sprout, then we have cold weather, and it reduces the crop and or the health of the vine by nipping this early growth. The, the buds that carry this year's fruit were laid down last year, so if you freeze back very far, the vine will probably survive, but you won't have any crop. You will have killed the clusters, killed the crop uh, for this year, and uh, you won't uh, receive anything. And that's the main reason that the last two years have been exceptionally low crops in California, because we had very widespread spring frost clear down Madera and south uh, last year, which reduced the crop of the order of 30% or more, depending on the vineyard. Moisture is somewhat of a concern with grape growing, but not as much as with many plants because the grapevine has a very extensive root system and with this extensive root system, uh, it can seek out fertility and moisture in rather poor soils. In fact, it detests, as the vineyards put it, vineyardists put it, wet feet. So you want a well-drained vineyard uh, for grape growing. But as long as it's well-drained and has a reasonable amount of moisture, whether by irrigation or by rainfall, the grape can grow well, the grapevine can grow well in areas where very little else will. Now, this is an ecological point of some significance. We occasionally get static from people that say, well, you know, grapes, after all, wine is a luxury and we could feed a lot more people if we grew wheat or rice or something else instead of grapes. Well, that's true. Uh, on the other hand, uh, many places of the world where the grapes grow, not all, but many places, Portugal being a very good example, just practically impossible to grow any other kind of a crop in a useful sense. So that the grape, in fact, makes use of a good deal of land that is not useful for much else. Some in California, if you go to the vineyards in the Livermore area, you'll find that the average, quote, soil, unquote, is rocks the size of both of your fists. And uh, it's pretty hard to visualize any shallow rooted plant uh, growing satisfactorily in a field of rocks with uh, practically no soil at all. Well, I will 
finish a few more comments next time and bring your outlines that you've picked up today and we'll go on from here.